Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. Today's guest is a grip with over 30 years experience and the inventor of several pieces of grip equipment that you have definitely seen, even if you don't know what it's for. Welcome, Steve Cardellini. So let's start with question number one. Um, When did you get started in the business? I started in 1973. All righty. And the union local that I work through in San Francisco uh, is a mixed local, which means they represent the people in all of the legitimate theaters um, and all the film work and conventions and stuff like that. And pretty much the, the way you got into the local in those days was you started out at the opera house. And so that's where I started in 1973 with the San Francisco Opera House. Oh, nice. And I worked uh, ballet and opera uh, from 73 to 76. And then I worked uh, three years at the American Conservatory Theater, a repertory company, very good repertory company in San Francisco. And I, uh, I actually worked two years in the prop department as the prop man and then one year in the electric department. And it was after that that I started getting film calls and then made the transition into uh, doing more commercials and motion pictures. Nice. Um, so how is it different doing the stage stuff than going into the film? Well, the, the jobs, for, especially for grips, it's, uh, it's entirely different. Okay. Uh, basically, all the grips do is move scenery okay. on stage. And you don't get involved in the lighting. The, you know, the, the work is entirely different. Um, but uh, I guess the first feature I worked on was a Chuck Norris movie, his first Kung Fu movie. It was called Eye for an Eye. Okay. And I actually worked in the electric department in, in that. But uh, after a while, I realized that uh, gripping came more naturally to me than, than anything else did. Okay, so now walk us through a day of being a grip. I actually am interested to hear what you did in the the theater. Um, so, like, I guess tell us kind of what you did in the theater and then what you do in film as a grip. Okay. Okay, so all right, let's say at the Opera House, it was pretty much the same as it was at ACT. So you'd come in, we'd go in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the opera would be up that played the night before because the opera also did repertory. They did a different show every night. So we would come in, tear down the sets from the night before and store them, Mm -hmm. and then we would build the last act that was going to play that night. And then the electricians would set all the special lights for Act 3, Then when they were done, we would tear it down, set up Act 2. They would light Act 2, tear it down, set up light Act 1. That would take most of the day. And then we would take a dinner break. Then we would come back at 7.30, I think the call was, and we'd work the show. So, you know, we would do at least act changes, if not scene changes, where the curtain would come in usually, and we would make the change and – when we had made the final change into the last act, and usually most of the people went home, and that was around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So it was a lot of hours. It was six days a week when I got there, nice. which was good because it had been seven days a week uh, up until a year or two before I got to the opera house. So now how about film? Okay, film, it's it's hard to describe a typical day because it, it can be so different. You know, it depends. Uh-huh. Or, are you working on a stage? Are you working outside? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Um, but, but basically, there are a few areas that we get involved in. The majority of the work is usually lighting. Okay. Um, the electricians bring the generator and the cables and the lights, and they set up the lights and then the grips uh, start working with the light that they've created. Sometimes we need to color that light. Mm-hmm. If, we're, uh, if we have a mixture of, of uh, incandescent light and blue light coming from outside, we have to color one or the other so that they match. Uh, a lot of times we're diffusing light, so the, the electricians might set up... Uh, and 18K, let's say, blasts this light onto the set. 
and it's very harsh. So we would build a frame that we would put in front of it with a white diffusion. There's any number of different uh, variations of white diffusion to soften the light. And then we would also cut the light. Uh, you don't want a lot of the light spilling on the background, so we would set a flag, a black duvetine flag across the top of the light and take it off the back of the set. We might uh, put nets in front of the bottom of the light to try to reduce the amount of light uh, you know, closer to the light, um, those sort of things. And then also the grips do all of the lighting that isn't electric, which is like uh, reflectors, shiny boards. Okay. So if you're outside, you know, we'll be bouncing the sun, sometimes bouncing lights with uh, shiny boards, or we'll be uh, dealing with the sun. A lot of our work, if you're outside, is dealing with the sun because generally – you're going to be shooting there long enough, the sun's going to start in one side of the sky and end up in the other side of the sky. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to see that change in the shadows. So very often we'll build large frames that go overhead, again, that have white diffusion in them, and that will knock down the intensity of the light that's on the, the subject matter, the actors, whatever. And then uh, if say one of the big lights needs to be high in the air, higher than the highest stand will go, then it's the grip's job to build what we call parallels or scaffolding mm -hmm. to get the light up in the air and to help get the stand and the light up there. So let's go to the, the fun stuff. Let's talk about your invention. Um, okay. Let's talk about the Carlini clamp. Okay. Had you created any other gear on the set before before that or after that or was only Yes, to to both of those. Okay. Um the first thing I created was what came to be called the candlestick condor mount, which I created in I think nineteen ninety eight. Okay. And it was basically just a very sturdy steel post that had integral clamps that would clamp onto the handrails of what we call a condor, a, an aerial man lift. Okay. And, and then it had a junior receiver on the top, which would receive the pin that's on the bottom of all of the large lights, the 12Ks, 18Ks, 20Ks. So uh, especially for doing night shots, a lot of times you end up with big lights in man lifts. Mm. And we used to just use chain vice grips and, and just chain vice grip a, a regular stand for a lamp in there, but that wasn't really strong and occasionally they would break, mm -hmm. which was very dangerous. And so that was the first thing I made was the condor mount. And then was it the Carlini clamp after that? Yes. Yeah, I made that in 92. And uh, I've been making that ever since. And I... Uh, I also make some camera supports, you know, like um, hi hats, very low support for uh, for a camera. I make one that has three radiating legs on it, so that you can level it and uh, and shoot when uh, when you're trying to get a very low angle and even the the shortest tripod is too tall. And I made a uh, quick release tie down for the bottom of the camera heads. So that every time you put the head on the tripod or the, the dolly, you didn't have to reach underneath with a, a separate knob and find the hole and start it and tighten it down. That This was a device that just dropped through the hole in the middle of the dolly mount and then has a knob. And when you turn it, there are three jaws that radiate out oh. and lock it in place. Oh, wow. So those are the, the major things. I'm, I have eight pages of products at this point. Wow. So how did you, I'm just curious, how like did you come to think about, let's, let's talk about back to Carlini Clamp. How did you think about doing that? Like what, what gave you the idea? Um, was it something that you were doing and all of a sudden you're like, you know, it would be better if I did this. You know, how did you come about creating it? Yeah, pretty much. The motivation was the fact that the, the baby pin clamps there was a, 
a clamp. We have lots of different clamps in the business that have a five-eighths pin attached to them because all the small lights mount on a five-eighths pin and, and some of the rigging gear mounts on a five-eighths pin, on this baby pin. Okay. The ones we had at the time had limitations as to what what kind of surfaces they would clamp onto and hold very securely. So being that uh, being a grip isn't a five day a week job, at least not in the San Francisco Bay Area, and even on the set there are times of doing a lot of takes where you have time to stand. I spent a lot of time thinking about how could I make a clamp that would work better and you know, sometimes you do that forever and you come up with nothing. Sometimes you do that and you come up with the Cardellini clamp. That's what happened in this case. And it turned out that it worked very well. So now out of all the things that you've created, why was this specific um, device named after you? Because I named it after me. But was there... I got to, I got, I got to decide what to call it, so I called it a Cardellini clamp. I, and I actually had some sleepless nights after I did that because I thought, geez, what if <laughs> they start failing and lamps start falling on people? And then, that, you know, I'll probably get drummed out of the business. But <laughs> fortunately, it didn't work out that way. Well, like, for instance, like the first one, the Condor one, um, why didn't you name that one after you? Um, well, I did commonly referred to as a Cardellini condor mount, but okay. uh, uh, I don't know. They, those were always referred to as condor mounts, and I, I wasn't okay. really looking for a name for it, I guess. I never really oh. gave it a name. So that one uh, had a specific a specific use. Is yes. that why? Okay. And the other one is a little bit more, could do more stuff. Universal, yeah. More universal. Okay. So just describe it one more time for our listeners that have like no clue. Sure. <laughs> Um, so the, the backbone of it is a five eighths diameter pin and part of it is threaded and part of it is unthreaded. The unthreaded part is the baby pin, which is where we mount our equipment. So below the baby pin, there's a V shaped jaw that's, that's attached to that shaft. It's pinned on. And then below that jaw, there's another V-shaped jaw with the, the V opposing it. So the inside of the two Vs are facing each other. Okay. And below that is an X-shaped knob that you run up the threads to squeeze the two jaws together. Oh, okay. It's, it's as simple as it could possibly be. One of my main, uh, in, the main things I wanted to achieve with this was I wanted to keep the jaws parallel. Because the other clamps that we had, the jaws didn't stay parallel, so it, it, they didn't clamp very well on flat surfaces like a piece of plywood or a two-by-four or something. Mm -hmm. So originally, I started thinking of all these scissoring mechanisms and stuff. And when I thought of, of this design, I said, well, this is as simple as it could possibly be. If that were to work, that would be the way to go. And I, I fabricated a couple of prototypes and they seemed to work. And so then I, I invested in molds and started fabricating. Hmm. Interesting. Um, when did you begin selling it? Like this was something that, did you just make it for when you went on set and you were working on certain things? Or was it something where immediately you made it and said, hey, you know, it became knowledgeable to, to other people or, and whatnot? And other sets. Yeah, I, I made it. Uh, I I made it to be a product that I would sell. Okay. And so um, I had those first four that I made out of steel, but I made the the ones with the aluminum jaws and aluminum knobs and stainless steel pins right away. And what I found out was that this is one of the best businesses to try to sell equipment. Yeah. Because what happened was. I, I sold four of these to a gaffer, let's say, here in San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. He took them out on a job, and a key grip from L.A. saw them and said, wow, where'd you get those? So he called me, and he bought some. The following week, that key grip was in Salt Lake City working, and the crew people there said, wow, those look pretty good. Where did you get those? So I had stickers made up with my company name and phone number that I put on the clamps, and they just spread themselves like a virus. 
Nice. So, so when this happened, I mean, how long was it until you, you could just live off of that income from your sales that you didn't need to work anymore? Well, I started selling them in 1992 mm-hmm. and I didn't retire until 2008. Okay. Um, but I was, I was waiting until I got old enough. I was 61 when I retired so that uh, I could start collecting my pension. Yeah. What the way the the way the process happened is the sales kept growing every year. Mm-hmm. So I was spending more and more time on the business and filming in San Francisco was decreasing and I was spending less and less time on jobs. And so it was just a natural transition to just go ahead, start drawing my pension, quit gripping, and just start doing the business full time. Nice. I mean, it's nice that you were able to invent stuff that works for your line of work and it actually, you know, became a business. I think that's wonderful that you could just transition into it. It's been very satisfying. Uh, Initially, I just hoped that I could put my two kids through college, which the clamps did. And then it's, you know, it's gone well beyond that now. Now, when you first started out, um, has the industry changed a lot since then? I mean, you haven't been working lately, but did, even in the time up until you retired, yeah. did you see things change? I mean, especially like you oh, created sure. stuff to make it change, but um, any in any other ways that I and I'm I'm assuming with those changes, you were able to develop and create more devices. Yeah, I mean, I worked for 35 years, so I saw a a lot of changes. Um, One of the big ones was in the size of the budget. It seemed like when I first started working, there was plenty of money to go around. And, you know, whatever you needed to get the job done, that was fine. And and then maybe halfway through my career, it seemed like things started tightening up and tightening up. when I was first working, we, we would do a lot of car commercials in the Bay Area because of the beautiful views up on Mount Tamalpais. And most cars look better in the early morning light and the late afternoon light. Mm-hmm. So we would go shoot for a few hours in the morning and then take the middle of the day off and come back in the afternoon. And we'd be on the clock the whole time because we had a 10-hour minimum on oh. commercials. But there seemed to be enough money to do that in order to get the best looking shots yeah. possible. And that money seemed to, to dry up. Um, a yeah. friend of mine told me a, a story that kind of that kind of explains how much money there was. He was a, a longtime key grip out of L.A. And he was working on a big uh, cowboy movie out in Monument Valley or somewhere. And... They were getting ready for a sunset shot. They'd been working most of the day on it. Mm -hmm. And they were very close to the time they needed to shoot the shot. And a pickup truck that was in the background went, tried to cross a creek and got stuck. And the engine died and they couldn't get it started and they couldn't push it out. And the director had the the special effects crew blow it up. And then they just carried out whatever pieces were big enough to be recognizable in the shot. And then they shot the shot. (laughs) Those those were the days when they had seemingly unlimited budgets. Yeah, he said, get that out of my shot. Go blow it up. Well, so you created stuff to make make it easier. Um, I'm sure they appreciated that because then since they don't have the budgets anymore to keep, you know, to just spend time doing nothing, uh, you speeded up the process for them, I, I suspect. I hope so. Um, <laughs> I mean, there have been lots of pieces of equipment through the years that, that have had a direct effect on, on gripping. The steady cam was a big one because uh, shots where we would have been spending a lot of time laying track and doing dolly moves, it suddenly became the steady cam operator's job. And then the, the only thing the grips have to do, usually we have somebody that stands by the steady cam operator just to make sure nobody gets in his way. That mm-hmm. If he's doing a backward shot, he doesn't trip over something or something like that. Also, there was an invention called the Russian arm. Okay. It, it, it used to be on car shoots. Anytime you were shooting moving cars, um, 
a lot of that shooting would be done off the back of an insert car, okay. which is basically like a, a flatbed truck that has very smooth suspension and is set up to be able to mount cameras on it. Mm. Or on an arm car, which was a similar chassis with a small crane arm on it that either had the operator and assistant on the end of it or later had remote heads on it. And the grips would, would operate all of that. The Russian arm was is and was a remote controlled arm that mounted onto the roof of a vehicle and is operated from inside by a special technician who does the panning and, and tilting. So pretty much all of that arm work went away that the grips used to do. Oh. Okay. And and now there are several different versions of what we originally called the Russian arm because it was designed by an engineer from Russia who, before he came here, used to design uh, guidance systems for missiles. Oh. Uh, another big change has been the, the size of the cameras. It used to be the grips would spend a lot of time mounting big cameras, you know, like uh, right. the smallest of the airy cameras, but still by the time you put a lens and a magazine on it, it's fairly big doing rigs with aluminum pipe and speed rail fittings to mount cameras where you could do a running shot of a turning tire or something like that. And now the cameras are so small that the, the mounts have gotten to be much smaller, much easier to do. Uh, now they have, you know, the small helicopters with cameras on them. They can do shots like that. That changed things a lot. And one of the biggest changes, of course, was the stuff they started being able to do in post-production. Yeah, um, I worked on some pickup shots for Return of the Jedi down in uh, Death Valley. Okay. And we were setting up for a shot, and somebody pointed out that there were a row of telephone poles in the background. And George Lucas said, don't worry about it. We'll take those out in post. I think that was the first time I ever heard anybody <laughs> speak those words. But that was sort of the beginning of a just a huge change. Before that, whatever you shot was pretty much what you got. Yeah, you couldn't take it out. And it's gotten to the point now where a lot of times what you're shooting is, is basically just a canvas on which they're going to paint the real story later on. We could do a whole lot more now. With oh, yeah. Computer graphics and... And, you know, green screens and all that kind of stuff. That's true. Green screen and blue screen work came around. That that made for a lot of very boring hours for, for grips and electricians. <laughs> you were back Lighting inside. You were back inside. Around. Yes, and back inside. <laughs> if you're lucky back inside, sometimes you were outside with big green screens. So now, what would you suggest to someone who's just starting out in the business, who wants to become a grip? Uh, what would they need to know? The, the first thing I need to know is, is what the equipment is, because the equipment that we use doesn't exist anywhere else. Mm. You know, if a guy goes on a job and the key grip comes over to him and says, listen, uh, we want to build a goalpost. So get a couple of combo stands with lollipops, uh, 12 by stick with two ears. If he doesn't know what he's talking about, then he's not going to be able to be very helpful. So um, I'd say that's the first thing to do. I mean, you can uh, get catalogs from some of the major manufacturers, you know, American Grip or Matthews or Norms, and just go through and, and see what the stuff is. And one avenue that some people take is to get a, get a job in a rental house. Hmm. Um, easier in L.A. to do because there are a lot more rental houses. But then you, you learn the names of equipment, you, you learn how to open and close the stands, you become more familiar with everything. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah. And then what I would say is once you, you feel like you've, you've got enough knowledge that you could be useful on the set, is contact the IATSE local that has jurisdiction in your area. Okay. And tell them that you're interested in, in doing that work. And if if they ever need any extra people, here's my phone number and, uh, you know, I want to learn. Does that, does that ever work though? I mean, do you see a lot of people getting work that way by giving them, because I would assume that they, yeah, you can give them your number, but uh, are they actually going to call someone that they don't know and they don't know 
how they work, their attitude, their work skills, and all that kind of stuff? If it gets busy enough in town, they will. Okay. See, in, in San Francisco, we have a, a limited number of people, and we have a lot of people. But if it gets really, really busy, that's when the opportunities open up for people that, that want to get into it. You might be the seventh or eighth grip on the crew or something like that. And then basically every every successful career goes through these steps. You, you somehow get a job and you go out there. Mm-hmm. Then you work as hard as you can. You learn as fast as you can. And you make a good impression on the head of your department. And then the next time that he needs somebody, he'll remember that, that you were trying hard and that you were doing a good job. And that's how you get your next job. And then, you know, it snowballs after that. When you see PAs on the set or in the office, what do you expect from them? What do you, what's helpful for you as a grip um, working with PAs? Um, yeah, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> when you work, working hard and, Keeping your eyes open, you know. Um, see, I work almost exclusively on on union jobs. I'm in ninety nine percent of it. Mm-hmm. So the grip work is done by grips. It's not done by PAs. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, the PAs would help wrap the set at okay. the at the end of the day. So if you're asking me what I would expect them to do for me in the in the grip department, that would be very limited. Mm-hmm. Usually what I saw when I when I saw PAs was people working very hard for very long hours for yeah. not much money. Yep. And um I could see how some of them felt like the work was beneath them so that it they they didn't really put their all into it. Mm-hmm. And that showed, and I think those people didn't last very long. Well, no. I mean, even if the work is beneath you, you have to do it as well as you can because that's how you get away from that and on to the next step. Right, and it's also that 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 work is important as well because that's that those things need to be done as well. And if they're done efficiently yeah. and well, then it makes everything else down the line a little bit easier to take care of. That's right. Yeah. So now that you're your own boss, what's the best part of your job? Well, the way I usually answer that, my favorite thing is if I'm outside and it starts to rain, Mm -hmm. I go inside. (laughs) (laughs) I really like having that option, which I didn't have when I was, when I was working as a grip. No. Um, That and, uh, I don't miss the 4 a.m. calls, and I don't miss the 7 p.m. calls and mm-hmm. working all night long. Um, yeah, I mean, it's nice. My commute is from my bedroom to what Your used to be room? my son's bedroom, which is now my <laughs> office. <laughs> so, so what's the worst part of being your own boss? Well, I hate to complain about anything because this whole thing has worked out so very well for me. But I guess the one downside is that the business is so successful and it is a one man business that I run out of my house that vacations are difficult. Okay. Um, If I want to take a vacation, then I need to send out a notice about a month ahead to my regular dealers saying there will be no product available, you know, from this date to that date. You know, if you need anything, order now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that that kind of limits the, the, the spontaneous let's get out of town sort of thing. Cause Dang it, you, you have to be know, responsible, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in this business, a lot of times people don't know until the last minute what they're going to need, what equipment they're, they have to have, and then they want it right away. Of course the, they the do. Shoot, the shoot's coming up. And so, uh, you know, I have to be here to take care right. of it. Um, and then lastly, what we always ask is if you were king of Hollywood and you could change anything, what would you want to do differently as far as being, let's say as far as being a grip? Would you want anything to be different? Is there any ways that you could improve it? As far as being a grip? Um, well, I guess I'd have to say that uh, 
I'd like to spread the money around a little bit more. Um, I do fully appreciate that it's the actors that make the movie successful. Uh, I was an acting major in college. Um, and I, I know that's very difficult to do. But I think if an actor is getting $40 million to make a movie and the, the grips are having a hard time paying their mortgages, mm -hmm. then maybe, maybe the distribution is a little bit out of whack. Well, yeah. <laughs> Not going to argue with you on that one. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure the PAs would agree with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Is there anything, I mean, it's kind of a different, you know, weird question. I don't know if it applies, but you, would you want to see anything different as far as you being a creator of devices for the movie industry? You mean that just uh, how it is doing business? Yeah. Selling equipment? And, and yeah. That? No, I, I, I really don't have any complaints. Um, I think things did take a turn for the worse when uh, everything got so corporate and mm -hmm. the decisions started being made by business people rather than movie people or mm -hmm. theater people. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a turn in the wrong direction personally, where the, the bottom line became so important that sometimes the art was sacrificed. Yeah, it, when it's taken out of the creative person's hands and put into the other people's hands. Yeah, the bean counters. Uh, yeah, then it, it creates a problem because they don't really understand what needs to happen. That's right. So that they don't they don't really it. understand how insane it is on a set when you're trying to right. to produce a movie or something like that, and how how much has to come from so many different people in different areas of the business and how it all has to meld and turn all of those individual efforts into something much grander. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure no speaking with you and very interesting. Right, well, good, good talking to you, too. Oh, well, it was so nice to talk to you, and you have a great day. Thank you, too. Okay. For crew call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the top of website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. Thanks again to Steve Cardellini for telling us about his experience as a grip and inventor. Tune in next time for a non-union electrician and grip, Chandler Forbes.